Hello, welcome to Stargate to the Abyss. This is your host, Witcher Gerlach, and I am currently returning to the library to return a book I borrowed last week, but like the interior is totally different, and I am so kind of confused about what's going on. But uh Matt, what about you? <laughs> I'm 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 trying to decide if I'm more of a Twizzlers person or a Red Vines person or like old fashioned licorice. I, I feel like I don't know. I think I'm more of a Twizzlers. Does the Iceland care to weigh in on this licorice debate, Vitlame? Oh, hell yeah. Those are shit. You're going to eat the black licorice one. <laughs> Who does that? The black licorice Every, one. Everyone here. <laughs> oh, Do you guys God. really like the black licorice one over in Iceland? Oh, are you kidding me? Okay, I, I okay for, for Christmas, I'm going to send you some, like, Icelandic candy because you cannot find Icelandic candy that is not filled with uh, black licorice. Honestly, we, I'm down, we inhale I'm the fucking shit. <laughs> I, am, I am down to give give some black licorice Icelandic candy a try. I mean, and... we like you would lose if you would walk down the, down the downtown and you see someone snorting it, you wouldn't be surprised. Oh <laughs> like 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 snorting it like cocaine. Like are we talking like are people not addicted to licorice in, in Iceland? This is it's uh, this is some breaking news right now. It's so funny because there was like this uh, like uh, medical thing like. As, like a survey or something, and they like, hey, apparently you guys have a really high blood pressure, and everyone was like, with the black really licorice, like, uh, yeah, and what about it? <laughs> and the doctor's like, you may, might want to maybe cut down on the black licorice thing, and Icelanders were like, fuck you, man, <laughs> never. <laughs> All right, well, my apologies to our guests, but we do have a very for this little preamble, but we do have a special guest today. Mr. Rami Unger, author of Henna and Other Stories. Welcome to Abyss, Rami. Glad to be here. Thank you. And trust me, I was enjoying the whole black licorice <laughs> discussion. <laughs> What's your feeling about black licorice, Rami? Like, well, let, let, let's dive in. We got we got what people think. <laughs> I actually haven't. I actually haven't had a lot of black licorice. Um, I think I've enjoyed what I've had, but mostly um, I've just had Twizzlers, and I've liked those. I, they're, Twizzlers are actually a big thing in my family because my uh, paternal grandmother or was a huge fan of them. And for years after she he passed, we would get uh, a big uh, pull-apart Twizzler packs and just <laughs> think of her. That's pretty awesome, actually. That's really sweet. That is really sweet. In more ways than one. Hey exactly. It's sweet on multiple levels. You got layers of sweetness. It's like an onion. That being said, the whole black licorice thing, it's going to come up again later when we talk about uh, the book we're going to discuss. Yes, which is yeah. The Library Policeman by Stephen King. But um, before, before we get into our discussion of our media and our discussion of Library Policeman, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself to our audience, Rami, as well as your new short story collection, Hannah and Other Stories. All right. Well, for those of you who've never heard of me before, hello. My name's Ram Younger. I'm a novelist from Columbus, Ohio, specializing in horror and dark fantasy. I've published five books with the fifth coming out last month, Hannah and Other Stories. It's a collection of short stories that features tales of ghosts, Budding serial killers and carnivorous horses, among other things. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and um, at the moment, I'm trying to get as many people interested as possible in reading it. And so far, I'm thinking I'm seeing results. I've been getting a lot of good feedback on it. So oh, I'm really nice. happy with the response. Well, I love to hear it. Is there any story in the collection that's a particular favorite of yours or like one that you want at least people to check out to kind of get used to your style? I love all the stories in each their own way. I got to say uh, my very cosmic horror story, What Error Awoke, ha I enjoy reading from that one um, the most because it's just a very strange story, but it also deals with a lot of what we've gone through as uh, human beings in the past couple of years. That being said, readers really do love the story Fuseli's Horses, which contains those kind of carnivorous horses I mentioned. <laughs> I kind of want to get to that carnivorous horse story, not going not gonna to lie. Yeah, I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they tend to get under people's skin 
in more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> and where where can our listeners uh, pick up the short story collection? It's available in most major retailers: Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Apple Books, um, the publisher Square Store. Um, it was published by BSC Publishing Group. Um, currently, it's only available in ebook, but if it gets enough uh, positive press, uh, positive reviews, and enough sales, we might see the a paperback version and even an audiobook in the near future. Oh, that's amazing. That'd be, yeah, that'd be pretty awesome to see. Yeah, well, so that's why I'm pushing as hard. As I <laughs> that's why I'm working so hard. <laughs> Honestly, I, I definitely understand that. And plus, hopefully our listeners... We'll have a link in the in the description to link to the web store to purchase it. Be sure to grab a copy, leave a review. It helps uh, every single author we have on the podcast and just books in general. And I can say I'm getting I'm kind of bad at leaving reviews. I'm trying to get better at it. But <laughs> <laughs> I used to be really good at leaving reviews, and then I got really bad at it. And now I'm trying to get back to that <laughs> to that level again. But yeah. that being said. Why don't we dive into our weekly media consumption before we dive into the library of policemen? We can still talk a bit about Hannah as well between then. Yes, well, The Abyss knows that when I saw Talk to Me, I said that was my favorite horror movie of the year. And I think I saw a better horror movie than Talk to Me this last week. Uh Uh-oh. What is it? When Darkness Lurks. Oh, I've been hearing a ton about this. It is going to be on Shutter. I think next week or the week after it'll it'll be on Shutter. Um, I drove down to see it in the theaters because I'm impatient. And to be honest, like I feel as as a horror fan, we should support the more independent or smaller releases in theaters over shit like The Exorcist. <laughs> As much as much as I love the original Exorcist, I have no desire to see Believer. Like, yeah, I'm waiting till it's on streaming. From everything I hear, that's a wise decision. Yeah, yeah I'll I'll see it on the streaming, but in the theaters, I just have no desire to see it. Um, so I decided I found out when Evil Lurks was playing, like an hour from my home. So why not go see it? And holy fucking shit, this movie, <laughs> like. <laughs> This this is anyone here ever seen the movie on Shutter called Terrified? It was also an Argentinian uh, movie. I want to see that movie, but I can't find it anywhere, and I don't have Shutter, so stop asking about that. <laughs> I don't have Shutter either. I've been yeah. meaning to get it, but just have not gone around to it. <laughs> um, well, that's it, that's a great movie, and I think he topped it with this one. That's awesome. The premise is like it takes place in an alternate reality where like. Demon possession is kind of seen as a fairly common thing. And like the church has kind of fallen in its belief and people who go services there because why go to church if demons walk among us now, you know? Yeah. Um, And so in the beginning of the movie, it opens up with our main characters hearing some gunshots in the distance. And then they go exploring the next day and they find a man who has an ID card. Well, don't find a man. They find the lower half of a man <laughs> with a box and his ID card that IDs him as someone who's a cleaner. And the cleaner's job is to go to these towns and cleanse them of a possessed body. And in the house that he was found there is a man who's been possessed over a year. He is sickly obese. He's dead. It's just a demon having this body now. Sickly obese. There's pulsating sores all over his body. Whenever he talks, bile just drips out of his mouth. It's very, it's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And if you don't dispose of him the proper way, other demons, demonic spirits will be invited to the area and it gives him a chance to be reborn in flesh. Oh, that's cool. And so our main characters try to move him and dispose of him the proper way and uh, fuck up really bad and spend the rest of the movie trying to fix their fuck up. (laughs) (laughs) And this movie's fucking brutal. Like, 
it it holds it, it holds no punches. Like if you want a mean, gory, visceral horror movie that is bleak as fuck, this is your movie to see. <laughs> All of this checks some boxes. So, I mean, <laughs> if I might have you have issues, what I might have to try and look this one up if I can. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, even though it's going to be on Shutter, you can still probably rent it on Amazon, or the DVD Blu-ray will be available in a few weeks too as well. So it'll be available outside of Shutter too. Um, but um, it just it goes for the jugular. If you're sensitive to violence against children, oh, no. not a movie to watch. Just going <laughs> to put that out there. Well, that is um, good to know. <laughs> and also, if you're if you struggle. With violence against animals, there's a little bit of that there, um, but not a lot. But just oh, no, to let just you know, the dog die. I, well, the the dog does die. Oh no! But the dog is possessed. <laughs> the dog is possessed by a demon. So, oh, so I feel less count. bad about about the dog dying. Yeah. Uh, but the that dog does count. bite a seven year old girl in the face. Oh jeez. And that's on camera. <laughs> All right, that that's I. You know, I'm still in. I'm still in. Like, the movie's oh. a lot, and it it knows it's a lot, but it kind of. I like how it embraces the fact that it's a lot, and it's so violent. Like half the time, my I was like, "Holy shit! Holy shit! Holy shit!" As I was watching this, <laughs> it's just a really, really fantastic horror movie, and I can't really recommend it enough. I do I do see the people who don't like it and I get why they don't like it but it just it just worked for me. It's exactly what I wanted it to be. So maybe just mixed expectations, but if you want if you go in expecting a mean, gritty, violent horror movie, this is it. Excellent. And I have also am almost done. I know we can talk about this in a bit later cuz but I have one episode left of The Fall of the House of Usher. Yes. <laughs> um, I have one more episode that I'm done and I just we'll talk about more in depth because I know you'll go over it too Matt yeah but um I'm loving it I think it's one of Mike Flanagan's best projects yeah and I'm kind of happy that he left Netflix yeah and is now kind of doing his own thing but whatever whatever he puts out I'm I'm, I'm there for just he's a really great great mm-hmm. filmmaker yep. yeah yeah this one's definitely a great uh, like swan song to get out of Netflix. I think he, he he's just like, here it is. This is what you guys are missing. This is what I'm going to do now. <laughs> and I, <laughs> uh, what I have to, to laugh is that he and I, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I've only watched I've the first four episodes. But even in these, like the commentary he kind of throws in is just so great. And it's t- some of it seems like an F you to Netflix and some of it's just like, Hey, I know a lot of people are going to watch this. Here's my thoughts on uh, AI and uh, pharmaceutical companies and animal testing and all these things. <laughs> I made I made a post uh, yesterday that was just the fall of the house of Usher is just spooky succession. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that. Yep. I saw that too. <laughs> It, it is that, and you know, I was and a little it, bit. I was like, uh, I haven't seen Succession, but should I know? Oh, Succession is so <laughs> good. I, I love that show. Yeah, no, it's funny they, it, it, and it's so true because, like, you know, I, for everyone that hasn't seen it, you know, it's the uh, Usher family, and this isn't a spoiler or anything like that. They kind of like run a pharmaceutical company, among other things, but that's kind of where this the story kind of is taking us through this. And, and I like, and it's great. It's a great commentary on that and just showing everything. Um, but what I found interesting and maybe a little like something he could have done is because is sh- the whole concept of like this opioid epidemic of this drug that they're passing out and they keep talking about all the death. And it's, it's like you said, succession where it's really focused on this family and like it in in my head it would have been interesting to kind of intercut some of like hey here's what's actually happening with the opioid opioid crisis and all these people dying and addicted to it and shooting up and everything like that just to kind of i mean i i like, but man, yeah. it's not addictive yeah <laughs> it's totally not addictive <laughs> 
Oh man, but they actually do do that a little bit later on in the series. Oh, do they? Okay, but good. not so much the regular people. Like you know how they, how his new wife. Yeah, they refer to as the junkie. Yeah, <laughs> because she's like taking a lot of that drug. Yeah, they by the end. This is a minor spoiler, but it's not like super deep. By the end, she wants to get off it. Yeah, and they just say at your dosage, if you're gonna get off this, slow. <laughs> and they go over all the side effects she's gonna have to experience. <laughs> over the course of three years while she gets off this drug. <laughs> like it's well, it's good. bleak at times. But like yeah. I also like how it has it has a good sense of humor about itself too. Yeah. Like definitely. I feel like Mark Hamill is super campy in, in his yeah. role. <laughs> he's so great. But he's he steals every scene he's in. Yeah. <laughs> Mark Hamill is a god. Yeah. He's so good. <laughs> he's and, like great he, he plays he plays the family lawyer author Pim, who yeah. isn't afraid to get his hands dirty. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think one of my one of my favorites is like the um, Roderick's sister was like, "I want you to go do this for me," and he's like, "What should be the receipt?" And she looks at him and goes, "Bring me the eyes, clean." And he just nods and walks away. Yeah, <laughs> it's just so great. <laughs> oh man, um, yeah. But no, it's it's a really fun show. I like, and again, not going to go super deep into spoilers, but um, I like how each episode adapts a post story in kind of a modern day setting that connects to the main plot. So it's kind of fun to see like how they're working the post stories into yeah. the series. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think my favorite so far, either the Pit and the Pendulum, they did a great job with that. Okay, I haven't seen that um, yet. <laughs> yeah, that's near the end, but they do okay. a great job with the pit and the pendulum. Um, so, also, the uh, the Mask of the Red Death episode. Whew. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> I saw I like was... a bit of it on, on uh, like from the trailer, and I got so excited because that's <laughs> one of my favorite post stories. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, they Get do, ready. They do a really good job with Mask of the Red Death. Yeah. Nice, because the whole the whole time of Mask. My favorite post story as well. So I'm. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with it. I haven't started the show yet. I've just been very busy with other stuff. Yeah, same. Yeah. <laughs> they also do the Black Cat. Yeah. And was... that that one, I will say... Can you please not... spoil this for me? If it does a cat die. Well, have you read the Black of... Cat story? I have read, read the Black Cat story, yes. So you, you know how it goes. God damn it. <laughs> like, but what I'll say is it's yes and no. Yeah, the, the 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 cat's kind of meant is seen more kind of paranormal in a sense. Oh, okay. Yeah, but don't spoil We're like, that. <laughs> but I but I can't really say much more than that. I do think the cat death in man, Mike Flanagan really hates cats. I think <laughs> I think the cat death in um Midnight Mass. It? No, Midnight Mass. I don't think was that bad. Just an island of dead cats. Um, <laughs> Haunting of Hill House. I think with mm. the shoebox and the riding cat, I, th- I think that was worse yeah, that than was... what's in than what's in this one. Yeah, this um, one like but... you're at f- you're at first like what the heck, and then by the end you're like oh okay, so uh, yeah, it, it's it's a shocking moment, but like there's a there's a capper to it so that you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, and everything happens pretty fast. So I don't think it would distress you too much, Villa. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, well, like, eat- <laughs> I, and this is not a spoiler, but it's just such a perfect like scene for that. There's a part where one of the characters is, and I won't spoil anything other than he's laying in bed and it's nighttime, and he kind of like turns his head, and all he sees are just these two glowing eyes. And I was like, oh god, I know oh, yeah. exactly that kind of cat moment. <laughs> Or like I, I love the also love swim, like just like when he reaches into the pillow and just blood all over his hand and there's just a dead <laughs> rat under his pillow. <laughs> so but I yeah, no more spoilers. You should watch it. It it's a shocking moment, but you'll be you'll it, it's not what you think it is. Okay. And also all the acting, all the acting is great. Yes. Um and also one thing last thing I'll say before I move on, the actor who plays Frederick Usher or Roderick Usher. Yeah. All those, all those Roderick Usher scenes were emergency reshoots. 
Were they really? Yeah. What? The original actor hired to play Roderick Usher was fired from the production for being creepy to the uh, women who were in the cast. <laughs> oh, oh. And really? Yes. And Netflix actually. So I know. So Daniel Barnett, friend of friend of the podcast, friend of me, he actually knows. J- uh, Jamie Flanagan, who's Mike Flanagan's brother. Yeah. And Jamie was saying how Netflix didn't want them to fire the original actor and kept the show going the way they could. But Mike Flanagan was like, either you, either we fire him or I walk. <laughs> so they fired him and they reshot all the scenes. Well, he did a great job. And like no, you, I, he was a, you, you can't even tell. No, it's I like, would didn't know. <laughs> yeah, like you honestly, if you didn't know, you couldn't, you wouldn't even be able to tell. And if you did know, you still can't tell. He's a fantastic addition to the cast. So I would, and, I really want to cut his little nub of a ponytail. <laughs> no, 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 no. That oh, those are different. That's you're you're thinking Frederick. Oh, oh, I the you're old talking the old man, the the the, the, the patriarch of the family. Oh, he was the one they recasted. Oh. The, Okay, I know the it, actor yeah. who the actor who played uh, that character with the ponytail, yeah. he was a little boy in ET. Yeah, yeah, no, I, like I, I just can never remember his name, but yeah, yeah. I, okay, no, he's that in, makes... he's in, he's in like every Mike Flanagan project now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I still anyway, want to cut the nub of a phony, ponytail, but that's beside the point. It's great. I highly recommend it. Um, other than that, I have been reading. The Flash Letters by Daniel Barnett, which is part of his Nightmare Land Chronicle series, and That's is awesome. fantastic. Nice. And I have also just started The Crow, That's Clash awesome. by Night awesome. by Chet Williamson, which is a handful of crow novels that they made in the 90s. Oh, <laughs> cool. And this is so bleak, but it's awesome. Like, I'll just read the back real quick, and then we'll go over to Matt. But it's um, it says... The Eternal One, at our human limits, but we've gone as far as flesh and imagination can take us. We meet the Eternal One, the Crow. Immemorably old and inconsolable, he is only there for those who seek revenge and love, and are willing to go all the way and beyond. A crazed militia has planted a bomb at a daycare center, and a dedicated teacher discovers it just in time to get herself and the children to safety. Almost. For we were in the dark universe of the crow, where the innocent must die so that justice can, justice can triumph. When a woman devoted to peace must don camouflage as she prowls her, with her black wing familiar through the tangled underworld of hate on a search and destroy mission that leads her from gun shows to the rubble of the disaster, a rubble that is stirring with a new and hideous life. <laughs> it's great so far. Super bleak. But Matt, what about you? Um, well, first, did that like get re-released or did, how did you get that? Uh, eBay. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can find them all on eBay for like five bucks each. They're super cheap. Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay. So, well, we sort of already talked about Fall of House of Usher. I won't go into any other detail then. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I think it's fun seeing all the post stuff. Um, even though I have like, I've read some Poe, but not nearly enough um to like be able to pull out everything but like obviously he's pulling off the big the big stuff he's done but i feel like there's a little bit more secrets of poe kind of things popping in and out so anyway it's great i'm halfway through it and like it's really hard not to just burn all the way through the things i am appreciating that as much as you know it's that funny kind of like weird time where some places are doing it like like releasing a whole season all at once and then other people are doing week by week and and i kind of like both so i am appreciating that they kind of released it all at once uh anyway that but i kind of brought it up last week in a really short thing but i did finish it this week that is the house of rejects and that is all about the rob zombie firefly trilogy dustin mcneil who did taking shape and a chucky book and clash of the t- uh clash of yeah titans between jason and freddie uh he did this and it's just this really deep dive into the making of those three movies as well as just um kind of a history in rob zombie which was really interesting to kind of like get into his his thing i and just it but then seeing like 
you know, I think they spend the most on House of a Thousand Corpses because that one had the kind of craziest like production history for him, just it getting bought bought and sold from multiple production companies and just everything that kind of went through it and his vision and everything. Um, it's funny that you bring up Crow because Rob Zombie was actually ta- like tied to a Crow project way back in the 90s. I'm so happy that didn't happen. I'm so it sounded, happy that... <laughs> it sounded awesome. But dude, every Rob Zombie project sounds awesome. <laughs> and most of them suck. <laughs> Halloween, Halloween 2, the Lords of Salem, um, all of the, them are sounded great on paper, but were subpar or in execution. Uh, uh, <laughs> here's the thing. I enjoy Lords of Salem. I know it's a bad movie, but I still enjoy it. <laughs> I, I think... Watch that and I'm like... Okay, first off, you put your wife in this one as a lead just to save your marriage, didn't you? <laughs> no, no. I think Lord of Salem is part of... I think Lord of Salem was just wanted to show off his wife's boobs. <laughs> I think I think that that, that that was a big part of Lord of Salem. Because she was topless a lot in that movie. Also, I'm pretty sure that at most of the time when they were filming some of the weirder scenes, they were on LSD. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. I well read this book because it's more it's um it it highlights some things and and some other things. I will agree he has he has a vision, but it doesn't always come across the way he wants it to. I think uh, Dustin uh, he did a good job being. Um, I'm trying What's to think the of book called again, Matt. I apologize. Oh no, it's all right. Uh, House of Rejects. All right, um, thank you. And like I think he did a good job of try like towing the line of like praise, but then also kind of giving his thoughts on it too. So like he 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 just goes kind of straight at it, but then like every once in a while you'll get a little commentary. Um, just so like it, it, and all that to being said is like I think Rob Zombie has his vision, and he has a a, a certain way to uh, dealing with people. Um, and most of the time it's good if you're on his you know if you're on if you agree with him but then it sounds like maybe if you don't he might not hire you anymore so um but most of the, all, all the cast and everybody that they, he talked to and everything really like if he's in your corner he is like if rob is if rob's in your corner he's gonna be in your corner so um it it, it so but like it, he the, the author did a good job of kind of balancing this stuff. Like at first he's really praiseworthy for house of a thousand corpses. And is like, yeah, he dealt with a lot of stuff, but then as you kind of get to the book a little bit further, especially when we get to devil's rejects, he's like, yeah, you can tell he learned a lot more here and you can tell like it, it just wasn't as uh random as house of a thousand corpses is. <laughs> and even with um, the last one uh, that now I'm three from hell, like he does a good job talking about that, but then is even like, oh, it just didn't match exactly. It didn't hit that same level of devil rejects, but he wasn't. Tr- uh, anyway, it's it's all really fascinating. Um, it's it's really cool. I will say, re- re- you know, regardless of what we think for him and and Sherry Moon Zombie, but he adores her. There's a part in this book where at the end of oh, he he loves he loves a shit of her. Yeah. <laughs> he, I like I had to reread this section and it's just one of those like like relationship things that you're like, oh, this is like a good goal and a good group. Uh at the end of Devil's Rejects in the movie, they're in the car, you know, and they're shooting everything. Uh there's like some helicopter scenes. Well, apparently, you know, they had to rent, obviously they had to rent the helicopter. It costs a lot of money. They had like all day kind of shoot. After like one take, he noticed that Sherry Moon was uh, upset. And she's like, oh, I just, something about the helicopter, you know, it's it's freaking me out. And again, a relationship goal for people. Rob said, all right, helicopter's done. <laughs> and they still had like hours to shoot with it. But because it bugged her, he said no. And, um, and, and they talked to Bill Mosley and he was like, yeah, man, if it was my girlfriend at the time, I would have said, just suck it up. 
<laughs> and like we spent all this money for it <laughs> but um anyway apparently like two days later the helicopter crashed so who knows maybe she was picking up something but anyway fascinating if you like it, it, if you like those movies or don't like them but you like movie making this is a great little like guide on how to kind of make more of an independent movie and stuff like that. Uh, last one, Brian Evanson, which again, I sort of, sort of talked about last week, uh, Fugue State. It, it, I finished it. It's a collection from 2008. And he uh, just, uh, again, like I said, he writes these kind of the stories in here. There's a humor to them. There's a dark humor, but there's definitely a humor. I mean, I brought up the nine for 90 last week, but the, there's um, just like some of this stuff in here is just so like dark and sort of comedic at times where you're just like cracking up. It's like the, there's a story about a guy who has to follow somebody and write notes on what this person's doing. And it just turns into this like thing where the person he's supposed to be looking after just disappears and so he wants to quit, but they won't, it, it, like, I can't even explain it. It's just, <laughs> Evanson is just an amazing writer. All the stories in here are just, like, pitch perfect. And he just, I I loved it. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't help it. Um, it it's a great, and, and he does this thing, the, the titular story, Fugue State, is like this memory thing where everyone's losing their memory and the way he writes it, you're frustrated because you don't know everything that's going on at the same time that the characters aren't don't know what's going on. And you like every once in a while will get a little bit of information. You're like you want to tell the character like, hey, this is what's happening. But you can't. And it's like an apocalypse thing where everybody's losing their memory. And it's just the way he can do that and the way he can get you in that mindset and feel the same way they can it's just like nobody else can do that that's just brian he has such an amazing style and yeah that's it for me awesome and uh rami what about you okay so i've been uh consuming a whole lot of different things in terms of media um because <laughs> that's just how i roll uh in terms of movies, I recently watched um, George Romero's Land of the Dead. Um, it's like the fourth film in his uh, Living Dead series. Yes. Is that with what, Dennis That Hopper? was the first rated R movie. That was the first rated R movie I saw in theaters. <laughs> <laughs> I wow. honestly did not expect it to be as good as it was. I mean... It was kind of campy in its way, but it was also really, really action-packed and really well done. Uh, for those of you listening, the plot is basically the years after um, the events of Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead, it, it, uh, the undead have basically he taken over the world, and humanity has um, holed up inside these small little colonies within cities with the rich often uh, being found within these gigantic skyscrapers um, while the poor huddle in the cold in the streets. And um, um, it, a bunch of the undead decide to have, to after a raid to, a uh, supply rate, he kills off some of their members. The undead basically go to downtown Pittsburgh after her, uh, the, after the raiders and the people there and basically go on a rampage. They kill off most of the population. And, the, and there's a, that's hap while that's happening, a uh, team has to go and retrieve Eve, a stolen vehicle for the head honcho of the Pittsburgh uh, community because it's like their best defense against a zombie attack. Like this, <laughs> it's a gigantic tank, but it it's shaped like a semi hauler trailer. <laughs> and honestly, the production values are amazing. There's some great classic race commentary. He, there are the fight scenes are incredible, and it's got some really 
good talent in it. I mean, John Linguizamo and Simon Baker are in it. <laughs> I'm not expected to be as good as it was. Dennis as Hopper, had. too. He's great in it. Who did he play? He what was he the head, head, head honcho guy with the skyscraper. That was George Bush standing. Oh, wait, yeah. who was that? Dennis Hopper. He was like yeah. the, lead, the lead guy. Yes. He was supposed to be a George Bush standing, actually. <laughs> yeah, and I just uh, owned it a really great movie. I loved how they show the evolution of the undead. And yep. fun fact, this is the first time in the series where any of the undead are referred to as zombies. The <laughs> night, dawn, and day of the dead, they are just referred to as the dead or the undead or ghouls. Uh, ghouls. Yeah, the, the script of the script of the first three movies called the ghouls. Yeah. <laughs> This is the first time they're actually referred to as zombies, and that's by Dennis Hopper. Yeah. Uh, and it's just one mention, but I noticed it. it <laughs> and, but it shows an evolution, because in uh, Day of the Dead, it's hinted that these zombies are capable of learning and of even retaking some of their old routines and knowledge from um, their uh, previous lives. And this sh movie shows that in action during uh, the the undead uprising in shows how intelligent they can be as they take down Pittsburgh. And I just thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And supposedly before he died, Romero was writing a follow-up that would have explored this a bit more, as well as the extinction of humanity itself. Supposedly it's being produced right now. Ooh, though obviously it'll have to wait till after the writer, the actor strike is resolved, but it's something that's going to be done. It's going to be his sort of his uh, last film, his posthumous release. So oh, I'm interested crazy. to see what, and since uh, Diary of the Dead and uh, Survivors of the Dead, it haven't and been so well received. I think that'll be a great way to end his, that series. Yeah, actually I have a, so I know a little bit behind the scenes stuff with George Romero and land of the dead seemed like the movie he always wanted to make. Yeah. Like the original, I I've read the original script for day of the dead because he originally wanted this big budget production for day of the dead. And the original script was like this epic Indiana Jones style adventure with zombies. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, like I see that. I, and I, you can see so much passion. Like it was a good script. It actually, was a really good script. And you can see so much passion, for, like what he was doing. That like I feel like Land of the Dead was him trying to do that big budget zombie epic that he had envisioned back in the back in the early eighties. <laughs> nice. Um, I, I honestly like even when I saw Land of the Dead because I saw that in theaters, and I remember everybody shitting on it. And I was like, this is a really good movie. Why is everybody shitting on it? <laughs> a lot of stuff we look back on fondly now. Oh, get yeah. shit on it. Even classic Simpsons, apparently. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just saw a whole video on that subject. Um, <laughs> uh, another thing I've been consuming lately is, that I wanted to talk about is um, I've been I listen to a lot of audiobooks especially when I'm cooking or when I'm driving. And I'm currently uh, about halfway through the audio version of All Hallows by uh, Christopher Golden. And I'm loving the shit out of it. Oh, that's it is great. so good. It takes place in, I think, 1984, somewhere in the 80s, but I'm pretty sure 1984 in um, – uh, Coventry, Massachusetts, on this particular street called uh, Parmetta Road um, on Halloween night. All well, these families are um, trying to celebrate the holiday. One family has a haunted woods um, attraction in their backyard. Another family is throwing a party. The kids are, are going around trick-or-treating, but there's all this relationship stuff going on around as well a lot of secrets uh of suburbia being found out what a woman is uh 
realizing her marriage is basically dead and has to throw her husband out of the house. Um, some teens are, are dealing with the fact that they're growing up and in a really weird in-between state when it comes to Halloween. Others are they're just uh, they're trying to find adventure before their lives change. And at the same time, as all this is unfolding, there are these strange kids going around the neighborhood looking for help. They say they're tr- running away from someone dangerous called the Cunning Man. <laughs> Who that is exactly, I've yet to find out, but it is just <laughs> really well done. And most of the first third of the book is just setting up the various characters and the relationships between them. And honestly, if you go with, I'm, if you are expecting like straight out e horror stuff right at the beginning, and you'll be disappointed. But honestly, I do not care because is the human drama is so well told and so compelling that I was just like, I want to know more. Tell me more. <laughs> And the horror stuff is just is coming in right now. We're starting to see these strange kids and the, this cunning man. And it is getting very interesting. And I'm looking forward today when I'm out and about running errands and stuff to listening to that in the car. Nice. That sounds awesome. It does sound really good. I haven't read Christopher Golden in a while, but... This is my first by him, and I'm really enjoying it. His, um... What is he put it a couple of years ago? I gotta get the name. I forget it right now. But he's honestly like Christopher Golden stuff. I've always I've never read a bad book by him. It's always been either average, good, or I love this. <laughs> <laughs> so like I I've honestly enjoyed everything I've read by him. Though no, his book Ararat Ararat has one of my favorite endings. Don't I haven't read it. <laughs> I won't say anything more, but I'm just gonna say the ending to that book is fucking great, like so good. But yeah, no, Christopher Golden, I definitely like any of his stuff. You you can't go wrong with. Nice. I'll have to if I really enjoy uh, the ending of All Hallows, I might look that up. But anything else for me, or is that all set for you? Mm, I watched the original Nightmare on Elm Street on Thursday while I was getting uh, some ink at the tattoo parlor. Oh, nice. 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 It had been years since I've seen since I'd seen Nightmare on Elm Street. Johnny Depp. <laughs> yeah, it was his first <laughs> film. And you can't even tell it's him. Yeah, I know. But it is it, it is such a good film. It is I had forgotten how well oh, they set up Freddy in this mystery. And yeah. I just watching it, I can, I was thinking to myself, I can see why. He, this became such a phenomenon and while they, they've made so many sequels. And that's actually a goal of mine this October is to watch as many of the Nightmare and Friday the 13th films as possible. I watched the first two Friday the 13th films yesterday, actually. And I might watch uh, uh, the third or the fourth tonight. Nice. Oh, yeah. I mean, you got to watch the third one. I will. <laughs> yeah, the, th- the third one's the best. That one, so I've seen that before. That's where he gets his mask, where Jason gets his hockey mask. But I've never and seen... it's 3D. <laughs> yeah, I've <laughs> never seen uh, part, part 5. I've never seen Jason Takes Manhattan. I've only seen oh. he, the opening of Jason Goes to Hell. Jason Ooh. Takes Manhattan is great. It's so <laughs> cheesy and so fun. <laughs> and you know they filmed it in, they filmed it in Vancouver. <laughs> and they're trying to pass off Vancouver as Manhattan. Oh, well, they're only in it in Manhattan for like what five minutes. So. Yeah, they got like one shot in actual Manhattan, and the rest of the movie was filmed in Vancouver. <laughs> it's just all <laughs> all on the boat. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, I get uh, to that movie soon. I also yeah. want to watch um, Dark Harvest, uh, which was just released yesterday. Yeah, um, yeah, it's up in any theaters near me, and I'm so disappointed. It's not in any theaters as far as I'm aware. It's only available through like Amazon Prime and Google Play. But I want to watch it 
and I might do that maybe uh, Halloween night. That's a good nice. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I got to pick that one up. That I love that novella. Like that's such yeah. a good fucking book. <laughs> that is a great book. Norman Partridge um, about a weird ritual taking place in this Midwestern town every Halloween in 1963. He, the ritual goes very awry and um, it falls. Those what happens when uh, the two teenagers try and figure out what the heck's going on. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it it is brutal. Some some good some good violence happens to children in that story. <laughs> <laughs> I will say be- before we hop over to our main topic of discussion, or Vitlam, I, I I did I did see Saw X. He totally skipped Vitlame. Like, oh, it's Vitlame. Oh, Vitlame. You. Vitlame, I'm so sorry. Vitlame. <laughs> Is it because I've been silent the entire time? Yeah. People just yeah, start forgetting that I'm here? <laughs> that I'm allowing Vitlame. people to say their things? <laughs> Vitlame, you go. You go. Well, I mean, I haven't been, like, consuming a lot. We did, um... Well, we did finish a lot of series, though, actually. Um... Oh. Yeah, we, uh, my husband and I, we finished watching season two of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Nice. That was a really good season. It just is so good this season. I love the guy. I love Ethan Peck, who plays Spock. He is just, he's doing such a great job of being Spock. Both his human side and his Vulcan side. And uh, I do hate the fact that they... Like he has this kind of romance with one other character, but at the same time, I'm shipping them so hard. <laughs> it's like at one point in the in the in the episode when they were like, when I like felt something, and I just looked at my husband like, "Do you feel that?" And he's like, "What? Do you not feel the fucking tension?" <laughs> and he's like, uh, "Maybe." And I'm like, mm, "It's good." And then I just like yeah, I don't know what's gonna happen with season two, but I'm I do like the fact that the enemy is the Gorn, and yeah. I I love the fact that they look horrifying. And I think it was <laughs> I think it was the uh, I think it was the last episode of this of season two where there's this like a nice little like a nod to aliens. Yeah. I can't I can't say much. It's basically like you just see like this kind of horn tail just like curling up. And I was like, whoa, if this isn't a nod to aliens, then I don't know what I don't know what. And uh, it was really good. It was like really shot really well too. It was like it would ha- it had like a horror element to it. Nice. I love the crossover episode. There's a crossover episode in season two. They yeah. they they do a crossover with uh Lower Decks. Oh, really? <laughs> Yes, they do. Oh, and it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. This like they they shifted. Like they like sh- they shot it part like animation and then part like act like live action. And oh, that's uh, awesome. It's so good. And then right after that, they ca- like the next episode was a musical one. <laughs> I love a it. A musical one. A musical one. It was amazing, but it was still so funny to hear that not a lot of the actors could sing. And my husband, he's like, he's really good at like catching, like he's 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 more musically at like advanced than I am. And he was like, "Whoa, this guy is has been auto tuned. This woman auto tuned. Holy crap, this person is auto tuned." <laughs> most most singers are auto tuned. Yeah, but Ethan Peck, Spock, he could sing. Yeah, although, I mean, although he had to keep his pitch really low because you know being Spock, uh, yeah, I just like like how the, all of them have a really good depth to them. Like they're not one dimensional at all, or two dimensional. Like every 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 character basically has their own story, which is and and they and they get a chance to explore it a little bit more. Which is nice because I yeah. felt like in other Star Trek series we don't get as much time for some characters to explore their lives or the backstories. So yeah, we finished that, and uh, we also finished <laughs> Witcher the third season, <laughs> which is really late, I know. But I uh, we, hey, we I haven't finished it either. 
Yeah, I we were going to finish it during the summer, but you know, after I got my like LASIK eye surgery, I couldn't really watch it. And my husband was like, "I have a feeling that there's gonna be a couple of shows that you might cry at, so it's not a good idea." <laughs> <laughs> and um, we decided to watch it like while we were eating dinner for some weird ass fucking reason. That's a that's a good reason to, to time to watch it. Well, yeah, but not, but I actually started like. And I have an episode where I bowled like an like a baby. <laughs> like there was this one scene, like um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spoil it, but there's one scene with one character, and she's like writing a note, and it's like really melancholic, and I'm just eating my like fried rice or something, and then suddenly <laughs> I I suddenly hear the shift of tone in which in what she's writing this person, and I just look up and like what the fuck are you doing? And my husband, like, are you okay? I'm like, no, no, this is bad. This is really bad. Something's happened. No, I don't like this. And then it happened. And I was like, <laughs> and, my, and my husband, like, looked at me. He's like, we came here to watch, not to weep. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, take, taking, like, drying my angry eyes, like, tears away. I'm like, I'm okay. <laughs> I don't like this. <laughs> But I finished it at the same time. But I, this, like, if I, if I ever continue, I don't think I will continue with Witcher now that you know Henry Cavill is not gonna be in it anymore. Me either. Because you can't replace him with that sissy over there. <laughs> no thanks, to Luke Hemsworth, but he's just not Henry Cavill. No, he's not. But he, and he's also, in in my opinion, I don't think he's that great of an actor. There's only one Henry Cavill. <laughs> yeah. So I think, like, I told my husband, like, if I'm, if we're ever going to continue with uh, Witcher Season 4, it's only going to be because I want to see what's going to happen with Jaskier and Ratowit. <laughs> like, I'm supporting them. I'm like, God damn, you guys, you need to be happy. <laughs> but, like, my but my husband just looked at me and like, oh, you haven't played the game, have you? <laughs> <laughs> and then he proceeded to tell me what happened, and I'm like, no. <laughs> so yeah, probably not gonna finish this, The Witcher. <laughs> um, yeah, there's just so many, like, there's so much stuff, like, ha like showing at the moment, and we just are getting like this des decision anxiety. Yeah, it's like you know, we still haven't watched Ahsoka, we haven't watched Loki season two. Uh, oh, that's good. That's good so far. I yeah. know. I've I've heard good. I've heard good things. So I'm like, yeah. And then, then we haven't we haven't started the Last of Us. And I just told my husband like I need to be emotionally and mentally prepared for that. Just go in. Just just go in. Just just dive in, mate. Dive in the deep end. No, <laughs> I don't want just to cry. experience. You want? I want to share this trauma with you. I know, but at the same time, I'm not ready to replace the one that I'm simping right now with Petro Pascal. Thank you. <laughs> it's like right now it's new and right now it's right now it's Neil Newborn. He needs his time first and then it'll be Petro Pascal. You can sit for more than one. No, well, I, that feels like betrayal to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Pedro Pascal. He's... Have you have you listened to Neil Newborn? <laughs> it's Daddy. Have you listened to Neil Newborn, <laughs> Rami? You need to listen to Neil Newborn right now. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll know what I mean. Oh my God. He's uh, he's the one who uh, voice acts Carl Heisenberg in uh, Resident Evil. Oh uh, shit! Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah I, I I I get that now. Right? Now you know what I mean. He was also in, in Detroit Become Human. He was Kamsky. <laughs> this is hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I of course I'm not gonna dwell a little bit more deeper into Baldur's Gate, but yeah, I've been consuming that a whole lot and I and enjoying every fucking second of it. <laughs> haven't haven't gone that far with my vampire elf yet, but it's getting there. <laughs> I want to play that game so bad. It's amazing. I it think looks you, so you, good. But apart from that, I've also started one audiobook finally, and uh, it's Robert o Robert Otone's uh, "The Wild Thing Recreated." 
Oh, neat. Oh, nice. Yeah. I actually should... will be seeing him tomorrow. Oh, nice. Tell him that I really enjoy his story. Tell him I will, but if I, if I go. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really good. It's like, I can't tell because, you know, I'm, child, I'm childless, so I don't have any kids. But he managed to really portray how, you know, deciding like, hey, we, we live pretty good lives, you know, being a childless couple. But then the social pressures <laughs> of having a kid is really yeah. highlighted in this story. And I just I really felt that. And but at the same time, I, if I if I were those if I were that couple, I would be like, fuck those people. Then if they can't <laughs> hang out with us we, just because we don't have kids, then just fuck them. Yeah. Um, and it's, he also really managed to just really lay it out how horrifying pregnancy is. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I mean, no, I'm good, thank you. Honestly, pregnancy is pretty much body horror. It yeah. is. It's horrifying. Did you know that they can consume your teeth? No. Yeah. What? <laughs> they can. Yes. Like if you're not on constant like vitamin, like you, if you're just not inhaling fucking different kinds of vitamins, they can just really just make you drop your teeth. Yeah. I... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, it's it's apart from that, I still also like the he's putting kind of like a Rosemary's Baby twist on this. Ooh, I like Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, I really like that story too. So I I like it's subtle. It's not like in your face. You you don't really know what's happening or why this is happening, but you are like, hmm. I'm sensing a connection there, but I'm not entirely sure. So it's. It's a really good booster to keep you to make you keep reading or listening. <laughs> and I really enjoy the fact that he also like one of the uh, one of the main characters. She's uh, African American, and I appreciate the fact that he put like a lot of research into how pregnancy is a lot more difficult for African American women. Yeah, like the complications that happens happen to them and everything. So I, I I really appreciated like shedding a light into that because I had no idea. Oh, that's cool. That's good. Yeah. So I'm like, I think I'm like what six? Uh, I have like six or five hours left, and it's really it's getting it's getting really interesting. That's awesome. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's it. I think it's time for us to dive into this. Uh... Library policeman, and out of all the stories you could have chose for us to discuss, Rami, why the library policeman? Um, I don't see it talked about as much as other stories, and it's just a very interesting, very weird, very scary novella by Stephen King. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> yeah, I will say I have I have lots of opinions about this novella. But one thing I will say is when this novella, like, hits at, like, the confrontation with the library policeman, the build of the library policeman, the mysteries around this library, I think all that stuff is interesting. And there are some really good creepy moments around, like, as this novel kind of builds itself up to, or novella, I should say. Yeah, and for those of you who've never read it, um, um, it follows a real estate agent in the middle of this um, Kansas his town who's asked to deliver a speech to a local, uh, I think it's the Rotary Club? It's the Rotary yeah. Club. Yeah. And he has, to, he has to go, well, his friend suggests he goes to the library to borrow some books to help his speech. Because it's rather dry he, as he... He's written it, and um, he meets a mysterious woman there named Ardelia Lortz, <laughs> who um, scares the crap out of him, but uh, lends him a couple of books, and later finds out that Ardelia Lortz is, has been dead for several years, and that the books he lent out, or that he uh, checked out, uh, have disappeared, and have likely been destroyed, and now oh, some entity called the Library Policeman, which might be associated with Lords, is uh, after him, and he has to 
figure out what's going on, find replacements for the books, or he, he, or something worse than death is going to happen to him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and as I said in earlier, black licorice plays a part in, in this story. Well, Lots more 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 like a Twistler, wasn't it? Or like red <laughs> licorice? Red licorice, black licorice, it's licorice. It's, just all <laughs> it's not oh, the no, fucking no. same! Red, red, red and black licorice are way two different things. Yes. <laughs> black licorice has salmic saltiness in it, while red licorice is just something disgusting. Oh my god, it's so funny. The main character would agree. Yeah. <laughs> Even after he... He's fought through his trauma. Uh, he still does, doesn't and like uh, red licorice. <laughs> it's and so he eats it anyway. Oh, <laughs> oh my god! It's so funny because so I read this way back in high school. I you know probably like everybody for four past midnight. I that one I has Langoliers in it, correct? And it yeah, has... Langoliers, it has Secret Window, Secret Garden. And it has sun... this, and it has the, the sun, sun dog. dog. Yes. And um, anyway, I bought it because uh, the Langoliers movie had just come out, and I loved it. And so I had the cover with the, the, the sh movie cover. Anyway, read this can, a long can I just time. Add, add one thing with Langoliers? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I was sick from school with the flu one day. And sci-fi had a link had a, had a Stephen King miniseries a thon, and the Langoliers when you're sick with the flu is a fucking fever dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not surprising me. Not surprising. I mean, cannonballs rolling up the world and the world past, <laughs> and everything's frozen. In, and the only way out of the past is through who a rip in space time. <laughs> Langoliers are gonna get you. Oh my god, with bul with bulky from Perfect Strangers. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I read this a long time ago, and it what the talking about all this licorice has stuck with me for twenty plus years. Be it because of this story, like I cannot see licorice and not think about him gumming it up into his hand. So, like, <laughs> everything else in that story, like, but between then and now, having read it, reread it, uh, the, all of the other things that happened, totally forgot uh, Mosquito Woman and everything, but the licorice is stuck in my head. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. and I find that the entity we're dealing with, the entity that takes on the form of Ardelia Lourdes and the library policeman, as it's very, we don't know much about it. It's very similar to Pennywise, you know, it. it, it I'm feeds, glad you mentioned that. <laughs> it feeds off fear, <laughs> or, um, but specifically in the form of child tears. <laughs> It hides in plain sight and has a lot of psychic control over its victims. Yeah, it. I. I. <laughs> we. We uh, were uh, actually. We were actually <laughs> talking about this before you came on, Rami. There was like, <laughs> I actually because I haven't read that many uh, Stephen King books, so I had to ask the guys like, "Hey, did this book or this novella was it written before it or after it?" <laughs> And apparently it was after it. So I immediately like <laughs> thought, so he was just basically still riding off the high from it. Well, and he has this tendency. I can't remember what episode we, we did one on one of his stories. And it was very similar to another one. It, he has this tendency to like redo what he's done already. Uh, um, you know, I like just i'm trying to think of some of the other ones now of course i'm drawing a complete blank but this one is very much he's like i really liked what i did with it i'm gonna do it again and just instead of the house on nesbitt street we'll have a library and instead of like a clown it'll be a librarian policeman mosquito thing but but the basic idea is exactly the same in fact you even have to kill it 
almost the exact same way. <laughs> I was just mm-hmm. like, oh, King, like, like I get it. You know, you had a good idea and you're like, I'm just going to keep chugging along with that idea. But <laughs> it's just like, you can do something different. No, we can't. <laughs> just, if like, it oh, fix it. That's what they say. Oh, I'm trying to, uh, if I, I'll remember halfway through some of the <laughs> other stuff, but like he's done it so many other times where he takes a story idea. I mean, like a great example. I mean, it's not the same thing, but sort of the same thing. We got Shawshank Redemption and like Green Mile, both in prisons, both kind of dealing with that life. And just, uh, there's so much that he does. And, and you know what, for King, obviously he deserves all the titles and praise he gets, but it's still really funny to be like, you're just, you have like 10, 10 story ideas that you just rehash multiple times. He does tend to use psychic children quite a bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, oh he, he even joked that he wants to have uh, Danny he from The Shining and Dr. Sleep have a baby with Charlie from Firestarter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But no, this was, this is, this, it is still like, I mean, there's one part that's pretty intense, um, just because real life kind of intense part to it. But otherwise, it's still like, it's, you know, crazy Uncle Steve telling us a tale. And like, it's such a funny, like opening it up just the way you were describing it of like, oh, it's like this insurance salesman guy, and he's got to have a a talk with (laughs) the, the, the club. And you're like, this is such a like sort of boring idea, <laughs> like, but let me tell you, it's going to get worse. And just um... I think that a lot of horror starts out from, from uh, the most benign of situations. And I mean, you think you're just uh, buying a new home and you find out that it's inhabited by very old spirits. You're, re- <laughs> you're uh, uh, going to the library and you meet the, a creature that takes on the form of a murderous dead librarian. You are reading a uh, classic English literature in a college class, and suddenly it brings up a whole bunch of repressed memories. That's the opening of one of the stories in Hannah, uh, by the way. Nice. But like I, like I said, it. just benign things can be yeah. terrifying. That's the thing about horror, or even a very benign situation can suddenly lead itself into someplace terrifying into a situation that ends up changing your life and your conception of reality yeah exactly (laughs) it's just yeah so i'm like because this is kind of long it's a long novella um well it's it's a long novella but the the plot's pretty easy to discuss like I, I don't I, I like to kind of get the pros before I get get a bit critical, but I felt like there's a lot of bloat to this to this novella that could yeah. have been trimmed a little bit. But that being said, I feel the bloat also adds to when the story gets intense, it also gets really intense. So yeah. it's kind of like the bloat that blows you along, and then you get to like when he first encounters a library policeman, it's a super intense scene. Or like um Yeah. When he goes to the children's section library and he sees the Little Red Riding Hood poster, and then yeah. he sees a poster of the boy in the back Simple seat of the stranger's car. Toy, man. <laughs> or um, when he sees the uh, the, the wear the library policeman sign and stuff, and like you're like, the fuck is a library policeman? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it starts bringing up all these repressed memories. I think. T- Sitting here talking about it, I think that whole novella is, it's a whole analogy or metaphor for one man dealing with his childhood trauma. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a still literally a supernatural horror story involving this creature or that uh, parasitizes other people and that and feeds off of other people's feet, especially children. But it is about a man dealing with his childhood trauma. He had a very terrible incident as a kid, which made him afraid of libraries, 
and red licorice. <laughs> Which sounds ridiculous when I say it like that, but then you read it and you're like, oh, God. Yeah, then you're just like, crap. <laughs> yeah, well, it's also, too, it's like he can't beat the librarian until he confronts his own trauma. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. why the whole thing is like the metaphor for his trauma, because he has to face his trauma before he can even move forward with himself. Yeah, exactly. With Ardelia, like, I'm trying to remember, like, why? Because I know we keep saying, we've been saying it, but is the idea of choosing, because, like, the idea is, like, you know, that it picks a fear. That's why it's the library policeman. But, like, is Ardelia kind of its state, like, normal state, kind of like in it? Pennywise is sort of its normal, like, state besides the giant creature like i was just like and i can't remember i got the impression that ardelia lords is just the latest uh form in a long line of them like ardelia lords was probably just like our main character someone with a trauma whom the creature um attached itself to and took over her war her, her form and moved to a small town to create like a new home in a library. And it would have done the same with the main character if it had the chance. And it would have taken him over her and then moved to someplace else, become a librarian, and then start the cycle all over again. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's what that like. And I don't, I don't know if about spoiling this. This is pretty old. But at, at I don't that, care about spoiling this. It came out in like 1990, dude. Yeah, that's <laughs> a, it's older than me, and I'm 30. So <laughs> that that's the the thing at the end in in the neck, and then okay, yeah, okay, I'm remembering now. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, it's just like it's interesting because it's like again, like I, I that I, the concept again, even if it's similar to it, it's still a really good idea. It's still this really cool kind of thing and really creepy idea of somebody feeding off of fear um so i like i'm fully on board and i just i think it's it's especially when you see the library at first and how old and outdated and everything it is it like i think it's just like this awesome setting um and concept with her so that was just like trying to remember i was like oh like i it it's it's that but like still i was like oh you know it can kind of change into your fear so anyway that was just me processing <laughs> i do yeah. i do we go quite we go to quite a, like, like some need like different places in this um you know like the shelter and 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 even like the train at the end i think or like outside of the shelter and the church and all that i i like that idea of this town takeover again like it but just this cool idea of this thing like owning some small town having been in small towns before you're like yeah this seems about right works yeah (laughs) i'm trying to think like it's just yeah i think i like the end and reading to the kids and all that stuff and like what it's like pink goop coming out of them right yeah Pink goop like cotton candy eel. eel. <laughs> Absorbing the tears from their eyelids. It's just so it's very tasty. Yeah. Yummy, yummy tears. It is when we say it out loud, it is weird as fuck. It is funny <laughs> as fuck, but when you read it, it it's terrifying. That's what I love. That's another reason why I love the story. I mean, I like really we- turning these really weird ideas into scary stories. And this is the kind of thing I would I'd have loved to have written myself. Yeah, right. Just like, yeah. I mean, that even like besides the, I think it's in the bathroom when he sees it. But even like before that, just the fact that the kids are all so like in a trance is such like, so terrifying and but like and and perfect and it's exactly what you said where it's like it's it's a simple thing of just oh i'm reading to the these kids but like just so terrifying (laughs) since it's king it's really hard to not talk about like is this this does this character show up in any of the other stories i don't know how much king you've read i know that the town where this takes place shows up 
at the end of Needful Things. Um, um, yeah. In the end of Needful Things, it's mentioned that um, the main character from uh, Library Policeman and the female lead, he'd have married and then moved out of town and where his office is going to be or, or where his office used to be is going to be the location for Leland Gaunt's new store. Oh, crazy. But wait, this is this is Junction City, right? Uh, yeah, Junction City. Wait, yeah, was, that this in, was, was that in Kansas or Nebraska? I think it was Kansas? Iowa. I Iowa, Iowa. Because also, um, Desperation and the Regulators both take place in this town. Oh, crazy. Yeah, I was just wondering that, because he, he, he does quite like to cross-pollinate his story, so I was just like, I feel like, I yeah, felt I like... I the same thing. Well, you know, what they, you know what they say, Matt? How's the wheel? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's what I was wondering, because again, all these ties to it, like, is it like the same thing? And I know it's not I the feel, same. I feel, I feel... Did anyone here read The Outsider or watch the TV series for The Outsider? I no. uh, I saw, I read The Outsider. Okay, no. did you read The Outsider, Matt? No. Do you but mind you can... a spoiler for The Outsider? No, you go right ahead. I feel like The Outsider, similar to this, is like the entity that is the entity in, in these stories. I feel is related to somewhat the entity that's in it. Um, that's a possibility. Because because in the outsider, it, it also shapeshifts. It also feeds off fear, specifically the fear of children. Only instead of eating their tears, it eats children, kind of like <laughs> in in it. But like we still have the same idea of this alien foreign entity that can shapeshift and feed off the fear of children. Ah, yeah. What the entity is, though, up, though, is still up for debate. I mean. In the Holly Gibney, it's one of the Holly Gibney stories. Yeah. Uh, you know, the character introduced in Mr. Mercedes. Yeah. And she comes across uh, plenty of entities in those stories that um, they, they feed off of psychic energy in one form or another, and they may know of each other or not. So like they don't all hang out, is what you're saying? Uh, no, there's no, there's no tea party. Oh. Yeah, like at the end of The Outsider, when they've confronted the creature, uh, they ask, do you know of anything else like me? And then in if it bleeds, Holly Gibney remembers that creature yeah. when she's dealing with a very similar entity. Huh. Well, I feel like King has a few of these entities running around in his crazy, crazy world. <laughs> Yeah, what author doesn't? <laughs> fair, very fair. I will yeah. say one thing I like about the story is the buildup, with just like the constant confusion our characters under of like, what the fuck's wrong with this library? I was in here a week ago, and it looked all different. Now there's like raised ceilings that have yeah. taken like a month to install these, a week and it's all different. Like, what's going on here? <laughs> I know that. Uh, yeah, I love that. And when they're all like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> yeah, everyone's like, "You're crazy, dude. What's going on, dude?" <laughs> and then just to tie to like people know of the librarian, but then like you know, it's just this thing of the, this like hidden or like a urban legend almost of like, "Oh, we know Ardelia, but like, why we are you talking talk about, about her? Ardelia?" <laughs> yeah. That's exactly. Well, why do you, you talk about her? What's going on? What did she do? <laughs> you brought her up. You know, you should know. I'm not from this town, remember? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. I totally forgot. Okay, here's what Ardelia did. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Did they ever make this? Like, did they ever adapt this into anything? I, think, I don't think so. I think they would, if not for, and I would love that, but, uh, the, the childhood trauma the main character goes through yeah. is just, I don't even think even a rated R movie would, would uh, be made out of it. It's just yeah, that, was, that scene is so hard. graphic in the book. Yeah. 
And I think if you change, and if you even if you change the childhood trauma, uh, that might change things way too much and make a, a faithful adaptation impossible. So I don't see it happening. I would love for it if um, some filmmaking uh, studio or team tried and was actually successful, but I just don't see it happening. Yeah, that I yeah, I was just trying to think of like, I mean, like yeah, it'd be tough. It would be tough to make it. Yeah, it would be tough to make that with that scene. But um, I just but figured they, it's also they've hard to it so much. It's also hard to not have that scene because, like, oh, oh yeah, the whole story kind of hinges on him facing this trauma. Yeah, and like, yeah, like that. I I was I was driving yesterday listening to the audiobook in my car when that scene happened. And like, <laughs> I like your rolled windows my window down. up and like, okay, I can't have people listening in on this scene. <laughs> Pull up next to some people, your bass is just thumping with these words and people are like, what the hell? <laughs> oh my God. Um, yeah, no, this like, yeah, it, it is funny, like, people don't talk about this one very much. Um, yeah, like, I never hear people talk about this one, and I had read this ages ago, so, like, it was kind of fun to revisit. Um, I also feel my taste with King has changed, and I'm also reading this as I've been slowly rereading It, which <laughs> I think is one of the best things King's ever written. Amen. Yeah. It's close. Uh, both of these are the products of cocaine, but one of these I think is. <laughs> <laughs> it was my first Stephen King story, and that's one I knew I wanted to write horror. Yeah, that's like a big you know one. What my first into. Stephen King story was. What was that? Dreamcatcher. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oy vey. Dream you, just, is such a... you just had to mention it because I told you about it earlier. <laughs> Honestly, that, that, that was my first King book, though. My uh, mother hates that book. It's terrible. She, if I so much as mention it, she will go on a rant about how terrible it is. Occasionally, she'll get it confused with the Langoliers, though, so you got to ask her. Her mother, are you talking about the Langoliers or are you talking about Oat uh, Dreamcatcher or even the Tommy Knockers? Okay, I'm getting real I'm close. Talking, I'm talking about that one. I'm getting real close to the microphone right now. If I have a choice between dimension eating testicles and shit weasels, I'm going to choose dimension eating testicles every single time. <laughs> <laughs> just, just gonna, just gonna put that out there. Oh, I'm with you there. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. If you have for the Langoliers, read the Langoliers or watch the miniseries. The miniseries, that CG is so bad and it's so good at the same time. The CG is the scary, is part of that. <laughs> it looked so I cool love, at the time. It, I love how bad it looks, but you can tell, like, in the editing, it's just someone dragging a mouse across the screen to oh, erase God. parts of the image. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, oh, man. <laughs> it is funny, like, even that, like, talking about that, but, like, overall, the, the this, like, collection of novellas, like, I don't think this one gets brought up as much um, as some of the other stuff. And it's like, you know, he... It, it's neat. I mean, like, he did some uh, wacky stuff <laughs> with this, but, like, I don't know. I remember, uh, I remember uh, Secret Window is great. I mean, obviously, they made a great movie with that. Langoliers, we just talked about, but I just remember the book being, or that story being, like, intense. And then this one, and, like, I kind of remember Sundogs, uh, but I don't fully. Um, but still, it's like, hey, he was, it, 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 it was good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that if um, Castle Rock, remember that show on Hulu, if that had gone on and beyond uh, season two, because they canceled it for no good reason after season two, yeah. they might, I think they might have actually, that um, if it had gone on for another couple of seasons, they might have 
have uh, drawn from library policemen because they were drawing from all sorts of different works. I mean, season two drew from Misery and Salem's Lot, two very yeah. good stories. And I and they even and the Sun Dog. They even and they used the Sun Dog in the at one and with the, uh, one of the main characters, uh, Pop Merrill it was so good at that show. You know, that it's funny that you bring that up and then us bringing up House of Usher. Uh, Flanagan, Flanagan must have seen that Castle Rock because I think that came out before The Haunting of Hill House. And, and like, it, that was so good. And it, it's follow, it followed that same kind of idea of like, hey, we're going to take King stuff, but not do King. And like, it, it's so funny that you bring that up. I was just thinking about that. And I was just like, That's, <laughs> that was a really cool show and i just loved like i remember after each episode like digging in to find all the king stuff because they hid yeah. so much in there that was just really cool oh, one man thing I, I, I wish they brought that back one thing i like about flanagan is like all of his house of usher actually feels different but like especially like the haunting of hill house feels like a mashup of shirley jackson and stephen king yeah no totally. and like a lot of a lot of haunting of hill house feels like an unwritten King novel adapted to like a TV show. Yeah. And plus he's, he's on King adaptations too. Like he's a huge King, King <laughs> nerd, but <laughs> you can, you can just see King's influence, like very clear on Flanagan's work. But awesome. I, I'm glad yeah. you brought this back. It's been a while, like I said, and it was good to, it was, it was good to get back into this. It's been a while since I yeah. read King in general. So. Honestly, I, I want to propose, I, I with Abyss, we could talk later, I like how we cover lots of smaller authors and newer authors, but it would be fun to, like, once in a while just dive into, like, some classic horror author to give our take on their stuff, too. Yeah. Because, like, the last, time, the last time we did King was, like, what, when Bo Johnson was on? Yeah. Was what like, was that? I forget what story we did with Bo. I remember we did... Um, fuck. We did one <laughs> Jeff Strand. Uh, that was the Ladyfingers. That was the Ladyfingers one. I actually used that line at the haunted house I work at. <laughs> um, and then we also did, when Patrick McDonough was on, we did Children of the Corn. Yes. And like, and then we did, and that's, that's it. And then this. So we haven't done anything else besides... <laughs> He who walks between the rows. <laughs> um, yeah, we haven't done a lot of King. I think it'd be cool to cover some more King or cover some Peter Straub or like kind of like dive into a couple like authors who are like modern classics. Yeah. And like just definitely. like give our take. Because like it, it's interesting going from like indie stuff or more modern stuff to like King because the styles are so different. If I may. I would recommend if you're going to do more classic authors, definitely uh, a, a look at uh, The King in Yellow by Robert Chambers, as oh, well yeah. as... Oh, that's going cool. that's cool. way back there. That's a good one, too. <laughs> yeah. As well as maybe a bit of H.P. Lovecraft. Oh, yeah. yeah we, we've done, we actually did The Hounds by H.P. Lovecraft. I think that's the only Lovecraft we've done is The Hounds. Uh... Call of Cthulhu and oh, we did one Channel other besides Earth the Hounds. And... Yeah. What was that one we did with Curtis Lawson? Uh it was the Tower the Oh man, I don't remember. But yeah, I, we, I forget. It... Yeah, we have done a lot of it. Like, I don't know, I think it'd be cool just to kind of like dip back into some of that stuff. But I, I want to thank you for bringing us Library Policeman. Because it is definitely an interesting story. Like I feel my my assessment of it is like when it hits, it hits really good. I also feel it has some of King's best tendencies and King's worst tendencies in a story together. Yeah. Because it is very bloated. Is something there. Is what? You might be onto something there. There's one thing, I and one of my criticisms about King, and I think this is more to like, if you King in his prime, was he overwrote a lot. And a lot yeah. of his books have a lot of bloat. And yeah, um, he says that a lot about Tommy Knockers, that there's like a good novel stuck between all that and gunk of words. <laughs> and yeah. And fit 
Uh, but he was way too uh, coked up at the time to really be yeah, uh, was, right. He was riding the white pony really hard during those years. So Well, and then the editor he was remembered there. Right, Cujo. <laughs> yeah, he, he, yeah, he, he doesn't remember any Cujo. He definitely had a really bad cocaine problem. <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy that he was able to overcome it. Yeah. Um, but I am thankful. I am thankful that his cocaine problem gave us Maximum Overdrive because I love that movie. Me too. Oh, man, I'm going to have to watch that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Maximum he, Overdrive. Says, he, he says Annie Wilkes is basically cocaine. <laughs> I, be, I believe it. Yeah, that, um, that tracks. Yeah, like Maximum Overdrive, that movie is a product of cocaine. Like, seriously, soundtrack, fuck it. Let's just pay for ACDC songs. All right, cut that out of the way. <laughs> oh, God. If you guys haven't seen Maximum Overdrive, it's what amazing. What are you doing it with is, your life? It's pure 80s horror cheese fun. And you have Amelia Westeves, who <laughs> looks like he does not want to be there at all. Yep. Yep. <laughs> poor, poor guy. Oh man, but but th- again, thank you for joining on the podcast, Rami. And also Thanks, remember, Rami. Hannah and other stories is available wherever books are sold. And where can wishes get in touch with you? You can find me all over the place. I have a website, RamiUngerTheWriter.com. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, Threads, Blue Sky, and YouTube. Ooh, I gotta get back on Blue Sky, but. Uh, Vitla May, where can we just get in touch with you? I'm like on and off with Twitter, so I'm kind of more lurking than posting at the moment. But yeah, if people want to shoot some DMs there, they can do that at Vitla May S. And I'm also on Blue Sky at Vitla May Mist. And uh, yeah, puts Vitla May out of the shadows. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. I, or <laughs> once I beat the game, maybe. <laughs> well, uh, I, but, but I also have a, a website with my best author.com. And there you can, awesome. you know, buy my books. And honestly, like, Vitaly's books are great. Be sure to pick them up. They're all, they're all a good time. And Matt, what about you? Yeah, uh, still on X. Uh, that sounds like I'm on a drug. It kind of is. Uh, Brandenburg Pause. DM. You ha- you have an announcement to make that we should have announced oh, earlier. Yeah, I can do that. Um, I'm in the new uh, Novus Monstrum that came out from Dragon's Roost Press. And awesome. it, 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 <laughs> Amazing! Congratulations! Thank you. It, uh, yeah, ton of ton of authors are uh, authors are in there. Joe Lansdale, Gemma Files, Gwendolyn Kais, Ramsey Campbell. Um, Sarah Hans, my friend Sarah Hans is in it. Yes, yes. Yeah, and that, in that it. story follows Joe Lansdale. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's not ready no for pressure. that. <laughs> yeah, so you know, read all those great people, and then you can read my little story about amusement park mascots and how uh, a new job. Um, so yeah, it's I'm in that. Like uh, FNAF meets uh, Willy Wonka. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Honestly, I liked your story a lot. I thought it was a really, really great story. Well, thank you. They, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a, it's a, it was a, it's a wacky story. That was my uh, take on a uh, body horror. <laughs> um, and then also, yeah, Willy Wonka and Walt Disney World. So <laughs> <laughs> just all of that stuff mixed together. Um, but yeah, you can get that out. That's uh Oh, and uh, I guess what Jamie Flanagan. I know we talked about that. I think uh, they wrote an introduction and. Um, Trevor uh, Trevor Henderson did the cover. Um, but yeah, Dragon's Roost Press, they have that out. And uh, yeah, I guess I'm on Blue Sky too. I think just search my name. It might be Brandenburg DM there as well. And that's it for me. Perfect. And you can find me on Blue Sky with my name, just Richard Gerlach. I'm also available on Facebook. And I'm trying to make a Blue Sky account for Abyss as well to move Abyss over there and get off Twitter completely. Nice. But as always... This is Richard Gerlach saying keep staring.